Facebook. And all right, Facebook. What's up, y'all? Prophet Debbie Taylor here for my weekly live prophetic word. Uh, remember that I'm here every Sunday at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, which is now. And I'm here on the second Thursday of every month for my series called No More Genies, where we get rid of our genie concept of God and we get a faith-based concept of God based on the word, based on scripture. Okay? So, uh, got a new prophetic word for you today, so let's jump right in. Oh, wait, I forgot I have to turn this one particular recording on. Hold on. And there we go. Okay, so let's jump into today's prophetic word. Jump into today's prophetic word. <clears throat> By the name of Jesus, we come to you just thanking you for Christ. Thank you for the blood of Jesus, Father. We just thank you for Jesus because all things are wrapped up in him, Lord. And apart from you, Lord, we are dead in sins and trespasses, and apart from you, Lord, we are wretches undone. We cannot live without you. But thank you, O oh God, for your blood, for the blood of Jesus, and thank you for the name of Jesus, the authority that's in that name, and thank you for the precious Holy Spirit. So, God, I surrender myself to you. Thank you for the privilege and the honor of God, oh, oh, oh God, of being used by you. I surrender myself to you, my mouth, my eyes, my brain, uh, everything I'm saying, oh God, speak through me and breathe through me and let the words you want spoken be spoken, that you might receive the glory in all things, that the body might be edified, the demons might be terrified, and that sinners might be challenged to believe in you, to turn, repent from uh, the flesh, repent from the ways of the world, repent from an unbelieving heart, and develop a new heart full of faith to have the relationship with you that you want. And I thank you for it, and I believe you for it, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, now, <clears throat> the prophetic word for today is, you got it. Again, the prophetic word for today is, you got it. What do I mean by you got it? Okay, uh, there's a lot of scripture to read, and then I'll jump into it. We're going to start in Exodus, and we're going to start with chapter 3. Okay, Exodus is the second book in the Bible and also the second book of the Old Test Testament, Genesis, Exodus. Exodus was written by Moses. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, known to the Hebrews as the Torah, known to us Gentile Christians as the Pentateuch, but it's the first five books of the Bible written by Moses, an Old Testament apostle and prophet of God. Okay, so Exodus chapter 3, I'm reading out of the King James Version. We're going to start at verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush <clears throat> is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. Now that is what is known as the burning bush experience. If you've never read it, again, it's in Exodus chapter 3. It's when God called to Moses from the burning bush. That's what I just read. So now we're going to pick up at verse 8 and see what God said to Moses once he called him. Exodus 3, excuse me, Exodus 3, 6. Moreover, he said, I'm the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land into a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites, and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you unto Pharaoh, send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I 
that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. Okay? And then that was verse 11. And the Lord says uh, in verse 12, and he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. Okay? And Moses said unto God, I'm in verse 13. Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Okay? All right, so there's some more stuff that the Lord goes on to say there, but I want to move over to Exodus chapter 4. Okay? Because the Lord goes into detail about what Moses is going to say to them and how the children of Israel are going to respond. That's the rest of chapter 3, but I want to jump over right now and just read some parts of chapter 4 to you. Chapter 4, verse 1. And Moses in Exodus 4, 1. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and caught it. And it became a rod in his hand that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. That means he put his hand in like that, into his garment on his chest. And he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow, white as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again, and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass that they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass that they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken to thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it upon the dry land. And the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth, or who maketh the dumb or deaf, or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. In other words, Moses said to God, Send somebody else. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well, and also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you what you shall do. And you shall be thy spokesman, he shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and he shall be, even how he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. And thou shalt take this rod in thy hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs. A lot of scripture. I know I read a lot of scripture. But the prophetic word to, for today is that you got it. Okay? Whatever it is that the Lord is calling you to do, you already got it. Okay? Many times what we think is that there's going to be this big magic moment, this big alakazam moment, and you think the heavens are going to open up, and ah, oh, and it's going to be, you know, the angelic voices, and the lightning is going to come down, and ah, oh, and that's what you think is going to happen? That's not what happened, okay? And Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, and that's not what happened. Blessings to you, uh, you ma'am. God bless you. Okay? God called Moses out of the burning bush, and Moses turned because he said, there's a bush that's on fire, but it's not burning down. Okay? And God explained to Moses, I've heard the voice of, the, of thy people. I've seen their affliction. I've seen the taskmasters. And I want to bring them to a large land. And what did Moses say in verse 11? Exodus 3.11. Moses said, who am I 
that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. So the first point I want to make after reading all those long passages of scripture, besides the title that you got it, the first point I want to make is that you're going to have to start seeing yourself the way God sees you. You are going to have, right, he didn't want to do it. You're going to have to see yourself the way God sees you because you keep saying what Moses said, who am I? Don't you know the first time God calls you a prophet, you're going to turn around and see if somebody else is in the room? Because you most likely don't see yourself that way. I know that was my experience. I know that, that when God made it clear to me I was a prophet, I, I was like, what are you talking about? You, you talking to me? Are you talking about me? Okay? You're going to say the same thing Moses said in Exodus 3.11. Who am I that I should go into Pharaoh? Moses was an apostle. Moses, Moses was a prophet. And he had the anointing from God himself because Moses and God had a face-to-face -face relationship. How do we know that Moses had that deliverance anointing? First of all, we know he had the deliverance anointing because when he was in Egypt, he killed an Egyptian because he was fighting and beating a Hebrew. The second reason we know that Moses had that level of anointing to deliver a nation, because that would be like talking to the president or the king of a country. Can you imagine walking up to the president or the king of a country and saying, God said, let my people go? They'll kill you. You try to do that, they'll, they'll kill you. They'll kill you dead. And Moses said, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring forth the children of Israel, a nation out of Egypt, another nation? Because God told him to. God gave Moses the deliverance anointing for a nation full of people because that's who Moses was. He was the deliverer of the children of Israel. But his response was, but who am I? He didn't see himself that way. So principle number one, besides the title, which is you got it. You already got what God is trying to get you to do. You have got to start seeing yourself the way the Lord sees you and not the way you see you. When you see you, you might see your shortcomings. You might see your faults. You might see your sins. You might feel like I'm starting late in life. That maybe I could have been something or maybe I could have been somebody if I started when I was young, but it's kind of too late now. I stopped by to tell you that Moses was 80 years old when that burning bush happened. I know people don't say that a lot. People talk about the burning bush, but they don't tell you that Moses was 80. Moses was at an age where most people, most people around you are just waiting for you to die. You long been into retirement and they're just sitting around waiting for you to croak. That's when Moses' life kicked him in high gear at the age of 80. So some of you may be looking at your shortcomings. You may be looking at your faults. You also may be looking at your past mistakes. I'll stop by to tell you, there's no person that doesn't have past mistakes except Jesus. And all that is what's in your mind when God looks at you and says, you're an apostle. You're a prophet. You're a congressman. You're a teacher. You're a mother. You're a spouse. You're a leader. You're a playwright. You're a, a, a senator. You're a king, like he said to King David. And all that comes rushing to your mind, all of your personal disqualifications. So principle number one under you got it is that you have to start seeing yourself the way the Lord sees you. And if God tells you, see, okay, here's principle number two. Principle number two is that whatever God requires of you, God enables you to do. That's why I can make the statement boldly that you got it. If God says you can go down in front of a king and deliver a nation of people, that's because he's already given you the anointing to do that. Because there's never anything that God calls you to do that he expects you to do in your own strength. Okay, that is literally one of the best things about dealing with God is that if God calls you to something, he's going to empower you to do that thing. He's not going to send you out there on your own. He's going to send you with his power, with his anointing. Okay, he's going to give you the power to do what he called you to do. So principle number one is you've got to start seeing yourself the way God sees you. Principle number two is that anything God requires of you, God will empower you to do. Okay, so Moses had the anointing to deliver a nation. But wait, look at Exodus chapter three, verse 12. And he said, certainly, this is God talking. He says, certainly, I will be with thee. And this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. 
When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. What does that mean? That means God was giving Moses a prophetic word that this is legitimately me. God was telling Moses the future. That when you brought forth the people out of Egypt, God already speaking about a future event. And they sh uh, you shall serve God upon this mountain. God had already sanctified Mount Sinai for the children of Israel to, to serve him on. You see that? God gave Moses a prophetic word about something that hadn't even happened yet. He said, this is going to be a token or a sign. So, in other words, principle number three is God will tell you about stuff before it happens to help you strengthen your faith. God will show you stuff in the future that hasn't even happened yet to help you believe. God said, here's going to be your sign. It's going to happen like this. You see that? Now, I want to jump back to chapter 4. So we're moving back to Exodus chapter 4. Okay, and here's what I want to show you here. So I gave you them first uh, three principles. But here's what I want to show you here. Moses started making every, every excuse in the book. Moses started coming up with all these reasons to try to tell God Almighty why he couldn't do it and why God couldn't use him and why he was the wrong man for the job and blah, 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 blah. So let's look at Exodus chapter 4 again. And Moses answered and said, But, but, but behold, they will not believe me, nor listen to my voice. For they will say, The Lord hasn't appeared to you. What did Moses just say to God? Moses said to God, They gonna talk about me. And that's why a whole lot of people have not walked in the will of God for your life. Because you said to God, They gonna talk about me. Okay? And they will. So what did the Lord say? The Lord said unto him, what is that in thine hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto you. Okay? God gave Moses power. And he gave him power through a sign. And that sign was so powerful that Moses was afraid of it. The first time Moses threw that rod on the ground and it turned into a snake, Moses was like, whoa, Moses. The Bible says Moses fled from before. He's like, whoa, Moses ran. Okay, I stopped by to tell you the next principle is that when God gives you the sign of his power with you, the first time you see it, it's going to scare you. <laughs> I'll just briefly give you my testimony. I was in the basement of my home church, and one of my mentors, one of the mighty prophets I grew up under, his name was Reverend Peyton B. Harrison Sr. He was in the basement. We were all in the basement. I forgot what the activity was, but we were all down there, and I think we just got through praying. I looked up, and I saw the anointing cloud of God coming in the air. I saw it just like I'm looking at my, my iPad and my phone. I saw it, okay, because I've been able to see in the Spirit since I was a very little boy, but I didn't know I was a prophet when I was a child. So I saw the arc of lightning coming down from God, and it was lightning mixed with fire. It wasn't regular lightning, and it was a cloud with all kinds of lightning bolts coming out of it. So a lightning, a cloud with lightning bolts coming out of it, and I saw the lightning arc, and you know how lightning arcs, but it was mixed with fire. And I said, this is about to hit Reverend Harrison, because when, when the power of God would hit Reverend Harrison, he would shake. Because it was like he grabbed two live wires because the power of God would hit him so hard and he would speak in tongues and he would lay hands on people and people would get healed and people would get saved and people would get filled with the Holy Ghost. And I was like, this is going to be good. And then that lightning arced and hit me. And it hit me so hard my chest hurt. And I said, wait a minute. <laughs> I told, I said the same thing. To God that Moses said, I said, didn't you mean to hit Reverend Harrison? And it hit me and it burned. It burned inside my chest like my, my ribcage was on fire. It hurt. I did not see that coming. And the Lord told me to go prophesy to somebody. And I did not want to prophesy. I'm like, I know you're not. Are you really talking to me? And I had to go prophesy to someone, to a family member. But what I said was accurate because it wasn't me. It was the Lord. And it turned out to be the right thing to say. But I didn't want to say it. I don't want to. I thought God made a mistake. I said, didn't you mean to hit Reverend Harrison? And that, that, that lightning fire just burned in my chest. It hurt. It hurt really bad. And I was like, 
And that happened more than one time until I stopped fighting it. You know that commercial where they say, I forgot what it is. It's some type of uh, cardiovascular or pulmonary disease where they say it's so hard to breathe, it feels like an elephant sitting on your chest. Do you know that commercial I'm talking about? That's what it felt like. The Lord would anoint me and I felt so much pressure on my chest. felt like an elephant was sitting on my chest because I was fighting it. Okay? And then when I finally said, okay, <laughs> I'm going to prophesy because you told me to, then that stopped happening. Because I said the same thing Moses said. I was like, I know you're not talking to me. And the first time you see the power of God move like that, you're going to be like, whoa! Okay? Just like Moses. Okay? Then, the Lord said, verse, I'm at verse uh, 6, Exodus 4, 6. And the Lord said, furthermore unto him, put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. He put his hand in his, in his, underneath his tunic or his robe. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous, white as snow. So imagine my hand, except it's the color of snow, just pure white. And he said, put thy hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe you, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, which was the rod turning to a serpent, they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither listen to your voice, Neither sh thou, then thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it upon the dry land and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land so what did God just tell Moses God told Moses I'm going to take your rod I'm going to turn it into a serpent in front of him I'm going to uh, take your hand and I can make your hand be leprous white as snow and then heal it and make it be flesh again and then you can take water from the river and you can pour water to the dry land and that water is going to turn into blood on the dry land so God told Moses, either they're going to listen to your voice, or they're going to believe the sign of the, the rod into the serpent, or they're going to believe the sign of the leprous hand, or they're going to believe the sign of, of water in the blood. So God gave Moses multiple signs to give a witness to the children of Israel that Moses was indeed the prophet God sent to deliver them. And that's what God will do for you. That's the next principle. God will give you multiple signs. What does that look like practically? Some of y'all have been trying to figure out which way to go. And some of y'all, you think you hear the Lord talking to you, but then you get a prophetic word. Then pastor preaches a sermon. Then somebody that don't even know you walks up to you and says something. And then you read a passage in the Bible. And then you watch something on TV. And then you hear a song on YouTube. And they're all saying the same thing. <laughs> because God is going to give you multiple signs signs okay if God is sending you forth as an apostle or prophet or if God is sending you sending you forth in a fivefold ministry office then there's going to be multiple anointings the anointing is going to be in your voice the anointing is going to be in your face the anointing is going to be in your hands sometimes when you're a prophet you don't have to say anything you just walk in the room it's the most disconcerting thing the first time it happens Sometimes you don't have to say anything. You just walk in the room and people that ain't right, they get nervous and they don't like you and they start giving you the evil eye and all kind of stuff starts shifting in the spirit because that prophetic anointing came in the room. Okay? And another thing that happened because it happened to me today, God will, God will cause you to walk up to people that you have never seen before and give them a word on the spot that's 100% accurate, that's right down their street, that's reading their mail. And the Holy Ghost will be like, go talk to them. You don't know them, and they don't know you. And you just walk up to them and say, I see the Lord saying, I hear the Lord saying so-and-so. And they just look at you, and then they just start crying. Because that is God speaking to them. That's not you. That's not you as a prophet. But when you walk in the room, you can also start to discern who ain't right. Because that's happened to me more than once, too. I've been in a situation where we were praying <clears throat> and the Holy Ghost called my attention to this one person and the Holy Ghost was like, they ain't right. And I, and at first I was like, okay, well, I don't think I'm supposed to say that. So I put my head down and the Holy Ghost lifted my head up again and made me look at this person and said, they ain't right. Then I came to find out as I got to know that person in that context, that they worship some kind of strange religion. They worship other gods. They believe something other than the Bible and in Jesus. They had some kind of side religion going, and the spirit they was attached to wasn't right, and it was because of their spouse. 
they were married to someone who had basically witchcraft and idolatry going in their life. And as soon as I got a prayer in a prayer circle with this person, the Holy Ghost said, they ain't right. And then I came to find out later, again, they had witchcraft and idolatry operating in their life. Some kind of false gods and some mind control because of his wife. Mm-hmm. Okay? And when you're a prophet, that kind of stuff happens all the time. It's not something that we do. It's the anointing. It's the presence of God. Is God with you and in you? That's the Holy Ghost telling you that. That's not the person. Because God is going to give you multiple signs. That's why demons don't like prophets. Because they know that when we show up, we have an anointing from God to see them and to call them out. Because demons have no authority over the name of Jesus. The demons are subject to us in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the son of the true and the living God. And they have no authority, no power, and no dominion. But you've got to show up with the name of Jesus. You can't come in your name. You've got to come in Jesus' name. But when a prophet is sent by God, we're coming in Jesus' name. That's why God talks so much in these passages about his name. And the demons know that. That's why they don't like prophets. Okay? Now, even after all that, Exodus 4.10, Moses was still coming up with excuses. And I know I'm talking to some of y'all listening to me right now. You still telling God why you can't do it. Even though God has given you power and God has given you signs and God has given you a witness and God has given you a call and God has given you a personal visitation. You still trying to tell God, but I can't do it. And so let's look at what Moses said. Exodus 4.10. And Moses said unto, Lord, unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. What did Moses say to God? Moses said to God, I don't really speak well. I'm not a good speaker. I'm not eloquent. He, and he said, neither heretofore. In other words, in all the life I've lived up to this point, I've never been an eloquent brother. <laughs> okay. And then he said, nor since thou hast spoken to thy servant. In other words, since you started talking to me, God, I haven't become eloquent just because you're talking to me. And then he said, I'm slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Now, a lot of people have interpreted that to mean that Moses stuttered when he talked. So we don't know if that's true or not. That's one possible translation. He says, but I'm slow of speech and of a slow tongue. So maybe Moses meant he stuttered, but maybe Moses also meant he wasn't quick. He wasn't quick with his mouth. Some people, you know, they got to think about what they're saying. Some people just don't have the snappy comeback. Some people just aren't like that with their tongue. And he said, I'm, a, I'm slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Maybe it takes me a minute to get, get my thoughts together. Okay? You know, and you're telling me to go, go down there and talk to Pharaoh. And maybe, you know, I'm, I'm not quick. You know, I can't, can't really think on my feet verbally that well, Lord. And, you know, and... Pharaoh might say something, and I might not know what to say, and it might take me a minute, and I might look stupid, and, and Moses told God that I'm not a good speaker, and I'm kind of slow when I talk, and you know, verse 11, and the Lord said unto him, who hath made man's mouth, or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind, have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. God said, I'm the creator of mouths. You telling me you got you slow of speech and you slow, you got a slow tongue and you're not eloquent. And God said, I made the mouth. So I'm going to be with you and I'm going to teach you what to say and how to say it. I'm going to teach you what to say. I'm going to be with this mouth that you just told me was slow. God said, I'll be with it because I made it. I handle it. God said to Moses, I got you. Then what did Moses say? Moses said in verse 13, and he said, O oh my Lord, sin I pray thee by the hand of whom thou wilt sin. What that means in plain English is, is go find somebody else. <laughs> Moses was telling God, you know, I just don't send me, don't pick me. I don't, you know, this whole talking to Pharaoh thing, you know, uh, you know, I don't think we can make this happen. So just go find somebody else. Just go pick, you know, you know, you God, you can choose somebody, but I'm not the one. And then the Bible says in Exodus 4.14, 4, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, 
and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth, and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do. <clears throat> and he shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. So in other words, God told Moses, after he got mad at him, uh, don't you have a brother named Aaron? Okay, he speaks well, so I'll tell you what. I'll speak to you, you speak to Aaron, and Aaron can speak to the people. And I'm going to be with your mouth, Moses, because God did not let Moses off the hook. I'm going to be with your mouth, and I'm going to be with Aaron's mouth. And I'm going to give you words to put in Aaron's mouth, and you speak to him, and you're going to tell him what to say. God took away every excuse that Moses had. And that's why the Bible says the anger of the Lord was killed against Moses. God got mad because God was tired of Moses making all them excuses. Because Moses was the deliverer. That was his destiny. That was his anointing. That was his call. And God said, I'm going to give you all these signs. I'm going to be with your mouth. I'll tell you what to say. And Moses was like, well, just pick somebody else. And the Lord was like, so let me give you the next principle. Here it go. Stop trying to tell the potter what the clay can or cannot do. One more time. Stop trying to tell the potter what the clay can or cannot do. You don't get to tell God, well, I can't do this and I can't do that. And I'm deficient in this area and blah, blah, blah. Because God going to look at you and say, who made man? Who made your eyes? Who made your nose? Who made your mouth? God said, I made you. I shaped you off from, well, you know, Lord, I don't write well. God is going to say, I invented language, and I invented the part of your brain that processes language. God's going to take away every excuse you have, and if you want to make the Lord mad, <laughs> then you're going to sit up there and try to tell the potter, the creator, what the clay can do. You do oh, Lord, you don't tell the potter what the clay can do, and some of y'all looking at me right now. You have been arguing with God for a very long time because you keep listing your deficiencies. You keep talking about what you can't do because I didn't have a dad growing up or, you know, I don't really know my mother or, you know, Lord, you say like Moses, you know, I'm not a good speaker. Don't call me to do nothing speaking because I ain't, you know, I'm not good at that. Or, you know, Lord, I get really nervous when I get in front of people or, you know, God, I don't have that much money. And I see what you're saying is a big vision, but I don't really have that kind of cash right now. Or, you know, Lord, I'm kind of old. And all that what you're talking about would be good for a young person. You know, why don't you go and get you one of them teenagers or get you somebody in college? Because I'm not, I'm kind of past that stage of life. And you're giving God all these excuses. And that's the way you make the Lord mad. When you keep arguing with the Creator. You keep arguing. That's right. Stop trying to tell the Lord what you can and cannot do because you're talking to the one that shaped you and molded you in your mother's womb. Don't you understand that when your mom was pregnant with you, God literally knit together your spirit, your soul, and your body. That's what pregnancy is. It's a gestation, a gestation period inside of the uterus, inside of the womb of the woman, where God has literally taken your spirit, which is this, the breath of life inside of you, your, your inner man, your container, where the Holy Spirit lives, taking your spirit, your soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions, and your body, which of course is your physical body, your shell, and he's literally knitting you together when your mom is pregnant with you. And when you come out, that's why you look the way you do. That's why you're born a boy or a girl. That's why you're the age that you are. That's why you're the skin color that you are. That's why your voice sounds the way it does. That's why you think the way you think. That's why you have the gifts that you have because you are an individual, personal creation by God that he put together that he knew before your father and your mother ever got together. He knew who you were and he knew who you wanted to be before your parents even met. And then when your mom was pregnant with you, he spent those months in the womb literally knitting all of you together, your spirit, your soul, and your body. And then you're going to get in his face and tell him what you can't do. You're going to get in his face and start talking about all your deficiencies and how you can't follow the will of God because I'm deficient in some area. I'm too short. I'm too tall. I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm too black. I'm too white. I'm uneducated. I got too much education. 
I don't have enough money. Don't nobody like me. They're going to talk about me. I don't speak well. I don't see well. Blah, da, blah, da, blah. And that's how you kindle the wrath of God against yourself, coming up with all them excuses, talking about what you can't do in front of the Creator. The Lord will give you the ability to do whatever it is that he wants you to do. But, and I told you that principle earlier, but this principle is you've got to stop arguing with the potter about how the clay go. You've got to stop arguing with the potter about how the clay go, how the clay works, how you work. How would you know how you work when you did not self-invent? Did you ever think about that? Did you ever think about maybe there's some potential inside of you that you just haven't realized yet because maybe you've never been challenged? Maybe you never thought about it. Maybe you were never exposed to it. And here comes God and God speaks to your potential because God told that man he had enough power and enough signs to get in the face of a king and demand the release of a nation of people. God said, that's who you are and that's what you're supposed to do. And every single excuse that Moses tried to give to God, God took it away to the point where the Lord got mad. Okay? So, today's prophetic word is you got it. I stopped by to tell you that when you hear the Lord, okay, I feel a prophetic word coming. I got to release something to you. When you hear the Lord, okay, here's what's going to happen. God's going to talk to you today or this week. Mm -hmm. God is going to talk to you today and or this week. And the Lord is going to tell you who you are and what he wants you to do in no uncertain terms. So all of you that are watching me live, all of you that are watching me on the replay, all of you that are watching on YouTube, the Lord is going to talk to you the day you listen to this message and or in the next seven days. And when the Lord tells you who you are, the proper response is to say, yes, Lord, show me how to do what you want me to do. Because the Lord might speak to some potential that you didn't even know you had. The wrong thing to do is to do what Moses did and start talking to God like, start listing all your inadequacies. That's the wrong thing to do. When the Lord talks to you, you say, yes, Lord, I might be afraid, but I'm going. I might be uh, apprehensive, but I'm going. I might be intimidated, but I'm going. I might be confused. I don't, I don't see the whole picture, but I'm going. Because that's the way Mary responded when Gabriel told her she was going to be pregnant with Jesus. Mary didn't understand everything about that. Mary didn't understand everything that was going to happen. But Mary believed Gabriel. Mary believed that God was able to put a child in her womb, even though she was still a virgin and didn't know a man. And that's how she became Jesus' mom. She didn't understand everything about the process. And I know she was scared because she was engaged to Joseph. And Mary was very young, like around 13 years old. And in the Middle East, if you had an engagement, engagement is more serious there than it is in the West. Joseph could have had her stoned. Mary come up pregnant and Joseph, no, that's not his baby because Joseph didn't sleep with her. Joseph could have had her killed. So God was asking Mary to literally put her life on the line to be Jesus' mama. And Mary said, yes. She didn't argue <laughs> with the maker. She didn't ask him but one question. She said, how's this going to happen seeing I know not a man? And Gabriel said, the Holy Ghost is going to put Jesus in your womb. And Mary said, be it unto me. And that's how she became Jesus' mama. If Ma Can you imagine if Mary had missed her destiny? Can you imagine how, how the kind of tears Mary would have cried if she would have discovered later? She could have been the mother of Messiah. And she's sitting up there arguing with God. So God is going to speak to some of you uh, today, and some of you is going to be this week, and he's going to show you who you are and exactly what it is he wants you to do. And when he does that, he wants you to say, yes, Lord. He wants you to believe. Okay? Hey, Sally, God bless you. He wants you to believe. Okay? Here comes a prophetic word. For behold, my people, uh, listen to my prophetic voice. Believe and you shall prosper. I will speak in no uncertain terms, and let you know what my call is for your life and what I want you to do. And when I speak to you, do not be full of unbelief. Do not be full of doubt. But believe me, for I am the Lord. I am the God of your fathers. 
I'm the God that heals the sick. I'm the God that raises the dead. I'm the God that made the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. I am the God over nations. I'm the God of the elements. I'm the God of the animal kingdom. I'm the God of man's kingdom. I'm the God of the water, aquatic kingdom. I'm the God and the Lord over all creation. Do not be afraid, my people, but hear my voice, obey my voice, and move into the destiny that I have called you to, says the Spirit of the living God. Amen and amen. So what that means is, is that when God speaks to you today or in the next seven days, because God's going to talk to you before next Sunday. When God speaks to you, whatever it is that the Lord says to you, just say, yes, Lord, and ask the Lord, how do you want me to do what you want me to do? And just say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And he may speak to a part of you that's been dormant since you were a child. What if you had a dream inside when you were like five or six years old and then it didn't happen and it hasn't happened yet and you just kind of let it go? And God comes along and says, that dream, that thing you did when you were five years old, God said, that's what I want you to do. I'm going to bring it to pass. That thing that you did when you were five, but you killed it, you buried it, you, you listened to a dream killer, or you got caught up or you got busy in life or you started having dating relationships or you, whatever it is you, you started to do, that thing you wanted to do, you just kind of let it go. And now you're 50, 60, 70 years old, 80 years old, and God comes to you and says, you know that thing that you wanted when you were five? That's what I want for you. That's what I want you to do. And if that's what God says to you, say, yes, Lord. Say, I believe you, God. Say, God, I don't understand everything about this call. I don't understand everything. I don't, I don't get all the details. But if you say I can do it, then I can do it because you already got it. You got it. If God says something to you, like I, the print, one of the principles I gave you earlier, he is giving you, he's already given you the power to do what he's telling you to do. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's a prophetic word for today is you got it. And again, our, our, our Bible references was Exodus three and four. For those of you that uh, came on after we started. All right. Now, uh, so I want you to be encouraged. I don't want you to be discouraged. And I want you to be ready so that when the Lord speaks to you today or sometime in the next seven days, you're ready to say, yes, Lord. You're not going to argue with the maker. You're not going to do like Moses and go through all these reasons and all this excuse about why you think you can't do it. Do not do that. But when God calls you, whatever it is that the Lord says to you, just say, yes, Lord. That was part of the prophetic flow this morning in church. We, we sang a song where we just kept saying, yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, we just kept saying yes. As God was pouring out his glory and his grace, we had to say yes. Okay? And that's what you need to do when you hear the voice of the Lord this week. Say yes. Okay? All right. Now, when you see me close my eyes and go into spirit, I'm asking the Lord, is there a need for physical healing? Is there a need for deliverance? Do we need to cast out demons, anything unclean? Is there any financial prophetic words? And is there... Uh, any more prophetic word he wants me to release, okay? So that's what we're doing now. Okay, I got a financial prophetic word, and here it is. The Lord wants me to say to his people that he needs you to believe him on the financial level that you're believing for. You need to believe him on that level. What does that mean in a practical sense? If you make $30,000 a year, but you ask God to take you up to millionaire status, and let's say you want to make $3 million a year, you have to believe in that $3 million. You have to see yourself making $3 million a year instead of the $30,000 you are making now. You have to start studying money so you would know what to do with $3 million when it comes your way. You have to start studying, investing. You have to have a plan. Because how many times have we seen people that get blessed with extraordinary amounts of money, and in six months to a year, they're destroyed because they didn't know what to do with all that money. They didn't have a plan. 
But God is saying that if you've been asking God for a certain financial level, you need to believe God on that level. You need to see yourself at that level, which means you need to study finances and you need to know what to do. What would you do if you used to making thirty thousand dollars? And in, let's say the first of September, let's say September rolls in and all of a sudden you get a three million dollar grant or let's say a relative dies and they leave you three million dollars and they will. What would you do? If you haven't asked and answered those questions and if you don't know how to function on that three million dollar level, you know what's going to happen? That three million dollars is going to come back down to 30,000 and you'll probably be worse off than you were before. You'll probably be in more debt than you are in now with a 30,000 because you didn't believe and you didn't get ready. You didn't really believe. See, because part of really believing God is getting ready to receive the promise. So in other words, when God promises you something, then all into that promise manifests, you got to be getting ready. Okay, when God told Abraham and Sarah, you're going to have a baby, they're supposed to go out and buy a baby crib. They're supposed to build a baby's room in the house. The Lord said, we're going to have a baby. Okay, when God promises you something, if you really believe it, you'll prepare for it. Or just like I hear people all the time saying that they want to get married, they want a spouse. If God has promised you a spouse, you got to get ready for a spouse because a spouse is a major life change. Your life going to change if you get married. you got to get ready to get married. Okay, But if you don't really believe that they're coming, you're not going to do anything. You're not going to read any books. You're not going to listen to any uh, teaching videos. You're not going to have the prophets pray over you. So you. Because you do know there's an anointing to be married if you didn't know that. Just like there's an anointing to be single, there's actually an anointing to be married. And if you are called to marriage, then you've got to ask God, give me, a, give me the anointing to be married. Okay? See, that's what I mean. If you really believe it, you'll prepare for it. But if you don't believe it, you ain't going to do nothing. Okay? And God is saying financially that whatever level you've been believing God for, or whatever level you feel like God has called you to, or whatever level you've been sowing into, you actually, have, you actually have to believe it. Believe you can be functioning on that level financially so that you will prepare, so that you know what to do when that level of finances come. Because if you don't, if you've been asking God for millionaire status, but you don't think like a millionaire, and you don't really believe you're one inside here, when you look at millionaires, if you say things like, that could never be me. Okay, you're not, you're unbelieving. When you look at Warren Buffett, do you think that could be you? When you look at multimillionaires, do you think that could be you? If that answer is yes, if you really believe it, then you'll prepare so that when God takes you to that level of finance, you'll know what to do. But if you don't really believe it and you don't really prepare and you don't really see it in your mind, because you have to use the power of your imagination to see yourself on the level you want to be on. And if you don't do that, then whatever level God is trying to lift you to, it's going to come all the way down to what you really think and believe. That's why so many people that hit the lottery are in worse shape one year later. Because they didn't see themselves. They didn't see themselves. They didn't really believe. Okay. Now, I don't play the lottery, and we don't play the lottery as Christians. That's not what I'm saying. God has any number of ways to bring you finances. We don't play the lottery because we don't gamble. That's not the thing. As Christians, we don't play the lottery. We don't gamble. We don't go to the riverboat. We don't go to the casino. We don't, we don't do that as Christians. So that's not what I'm advocating. Just to be clear, I'm just saying, however it is that God delivers you financially, you must see yourself that way. You know, find yourself a financial hero and say, one day, I'm going to be like that. I found out a whole lot of people won't do that. Find yourself, this, find yourself somebody that's living on the financial level that you want to live on and study their life and say, one day, I'm going to be rolling financially like that. That's going to be me. And that's how you use the power of confession and the power of your faith to get ready to handle the level of finances that God is trying to bring in your life. Okay? Okay, I think that's it. So, thank you so much for tuning in. Those of you that have tuned in live, 
those of you that are watching on the replay, thank you so much for watching the replay. God bless you. Um, you know, I say it every week. I count it a privilege to be used by God prophetically because God don't need me. <laughs> God don't need me for nothing. What was he doing before I was born? God don't need me. What he need me for? God does not need me, but God gives us an opportunity. Serving God is an opportunity to not waste your life, but to be a part of his kingdom and his program. Okay? And I count it a privilege and an honor to be used by God. So thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for watching the replay. Again, you can catch me uh, every Sunday at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time uh, with a fresh, a live prophetic word on Facebook and Periscope. And then you can watch the replay on those same channels, Facebook or Periscope. It's also on my Twitter. My Twitter is PDTSOTC. PDTSOTC. Uh, this broadcast is on there. And in about an hour, it'll be on YouTube because I'll upload the video to YouTube. Okay? So God bless you. Have a great week. And remember the word for you because the Lord's going to talk to you today or in the next seven days. And the word for this week is you got it. You got it. You got it. God bless.